So we're going to talk about report writing. This is generally a session that I do over a couple hours, so I'll, I'll talk fast and get it done, and we'll try to leave some room for uh, questions a little bit later. So I think we have about an hour. And uh, I call this report writing follies because some of it is is just kind of silly and, and stuff that we, we shouldn't let pass. You know, if, if you can, you want to try and get somebody to proofread your reports, which I know is really hard. So, I mean, I just wrote a big uh, commercial property report and asked my wife to proofread it. And, you know, it took a couple of days, but we got it done. And, you know, as always, there were some mistakes in it. So I try to, to reduce the amount of mistakes, um, but it can be difficult on, especially on home inspections where your turnover is usually pretty quick. So, uh, but still your report writing can get you into trouble. So that's what this, where I'm coming from with this type of a presentation, because I've seen a lot of reports. I worked on over uh, 800 home inspector claims, and I, I see a lot of it where it seems to be kind of consistent. And some of it is is just mistakes, misspellings. Other times it's missing word. A simple little missing word can make a huge difference in your, your presentation. So um, as this sign points out, misspelling is a big deal. You know, just a simple little missing letter here certainly changes the intent of the sign. So I, I don't know if anybody's thinking thick tonight. I certainly would not be. So, you know, a stupid little misspelling, which is easy to do in a report, can certainly change the meaning of what you're trying to present, which we can see here. Now, remember that your reports, oftentimes your reporting software or, or even Microsoft Word or wh whatever you're using, doesn't spell check your photo captions for some reason. So you know, this is something that, that happens a lot. I see a lot of mistakes in photo captions and some of them are really funny, like this one. So it, uh, you know, it can happen. And you know, actually that's, that's a word instead of shut off, we have a different word. And, and you know, that may have just passed spell check because it's actually a word. I think it's probably in the dictionary right now. So you know, be careful, make sure you check your, your, um, your photo captions, because a lot of times for some reason they're not getting grammar checked or spell checked. So um, take a look at them closely. Now, this is the intent of this photograph is to point out the real the helpfulness of a photograph, which is in the background. This is actually at a store called Smart and Final here in Southern California. And the first thing I saw was this sign and it says tasty ass crackers. So I'm thinking, okay, they must be really good. But then I look at the box and, okay, they mean tasty brand. And it's assorted crackers. So it's not a tasty ass cracker. It's tasty brand assorted crackers. And you can see by going to the, to the, uh, the photograph in the background, you can see what they're talking about. But if you read the text, I'm kind of, you know, it's not the same thing as what I see in the, in the picture. So anyway, um, I see we've got some people posting on the, uh, the, the chat. Let's see here. We present an ethical. All right, we got you. Give the sign. You're waiting. Uh, grammar difference between knowing your crap. Yeah, <laughs> I know some of that's pretty funny. So anyway, I'll try to answer questions later about getting distracted. So you know, a photograph can really help people understand what's going on. And as Hollis alluded to previously, um, I started doing this before there were digital photographs. So many times our reports were text only. So you had to really make sure that you were good at describing things. Otherwise, you were getting question phone calls, which will take up your time and burn up time that you could be doing something else. So even if you get you know, one or two 10-minute phone calls a day, or maybe it's five, that's a lot of time. That could be almost an hour. Okay, moving on to the next one. Now, this is a, obviously it's a headline for a newspaper article and it's missing a hyphen, or maybe you should com com combine that first in hand, uh, first hand job experience, because this can be interpreted many different ways. So if you're writing reports like this, it can be confusing, or you can have you know two different meanings for that sentence. So this is one where some people are going to read it one way, and others an another way. So you want to try to keep that that uh, question or the, the different interpretations out of the report. You want to make it as clear as possible so that Anybody reading that report can understand what's going on. So, you know, here's another one that's that's just a weird phrases. You know, empty when full. Well, okay, I think I get that, but it could have several interpretation possibilities. So we have to make sure that our report writing is clear. And technical report writing it can be difficult, 
But really, you know, if you can maybe just have a, a lay person who doesn't understand home inspection like we do, read one of your reports every once in a while just to kind of give you a, a check on that and see if you're you're explaining things fully. The way I like to look at my report is that it should be written so that a person reading it who's never seen the house can picture it in their head. So that's best. And also my grandmother should be able to understand it. So that's, uh, that's pretty much how I try to write reports. So we're gonna look at some other expectations. Now this is something here which is interesting because if you look at this disposable easy grip, now this is a, a person who works at the company that makes these things and complained that a customer uh, complained that when they opened their barbecue, the food wasn't there. And when he said that the picture is just an indication of what you could cook on the grill, she said she had four more at home in the freezer. So, you know, this is interesting in that I kind of agree. If you look at the picture on the barbecue there, they're showing food. Now, would I expect it to be in this box that's not in the freezer or refrigerator when I buy it? <clears throat> Probably not. So, you know, it just, it, this one is is certainly portraying unclear expectations because if you bought this grill, you might think that there's food with it, which apparently some customers did, which is, is kind of funny. Okay, now this, this guy probably gets a lot of hits on his website every time I do this, this seminar, but you know, choosing this name for your, your company, Nothing Missed, that's an interesting marketing uh, uh, you know, idea. However, I think that you're probably setting unreasonable expectations right up front before you even write a report. So uh, I, would, I would suggest that we all be careful when we're naming our, our, co our companies and that we don't use pick a name which people will now expect things that are unreasonable because of the name. And certainly nothing missed home inspections, I think is probably gonna be problematic. I wonder what his insurance company thinks about, about that name. Okay, so <clears throat> this is getting into some actual scans from reports and I, I have sanitized them so that you can't tell who wrote the report, but this is, from a, a certain report that I've seen a couple of times. And this, this is a matrix. And I understand that the, the intent behind it is to provide a whole lot of information in a small space. Now, <clears throat> I have a hard time understanding this as a, as a home inspector for 35 years. And in looking at it, the first thing that I see is we have all these, these keybacks from these, uh, either a letter or, or abbreviation. And you can see where we have you know, yes and no and functional, marginal, poor, deficiency, repair, or replace, which are kind of all just about the same thing to me. Inspected, not inspected, not present, summary for your information. Okay. SH, safety spelled wrong recommendations, uh, PL punch list item, and then delayed maintenance. And does that mean I can delay it or it's been delayed? So I, I think this is very unclear. And one of the first things I noticed when I looked at it is we have this column here called inspected. And I think the way that it works is there's supposed to be a bullet there in every item, every line item that's been inspected. And unfortunately there's none. So that would tell me as a reader of the inspection report that it wasn't inspected. Although we have condition of exterior walls is functional. We have condition of gable walls and so on functional. We've got doors are M marginal. We've got, is glass disco discolored? Yes. And then down here, garage door opener, SH, safety recommendation. So a number of different things that it, I, I guess you have to read the report to find the recommendation because it doesn't tell you what, where to go. But I presume that there's, you know, that's what I would be doing if I was reading this report and trying to understand what I should be asking for of the seller, if anything, with this inspection report had I paid for it and was buying the house. So it just seems to be a little bit uh, tough to, to ascertain what's going on in this, this type of matrix. And you have to put everything in the report anyway, because we're supposed to describe the inspected systems. We're supposed to tell people you know, what's wrong and, and why should they care, and then also give them some direction what to do. So this is kind of worthless from, from my perspective, because it doesn't provide the required information for the client who's using this report. 
So anyway, I would avoid confusing matrices like this. And especially when you have multiple definitions here at the bottom, which are very close. Now, poor, deficiency, repair, replace. Oh, okay, you know, maybe you could use several of those for, for one certain um, um, defect, but uh, you know, it's just, it's confusing. So, and also spell check your captions. You can see we've got safety spelled wrong here. All right, moving on. I've picked on this one enough. So this is from a report <clears throat> that I scanned right from the report as I'm reading through it because this is very difficult. Now, my suggestion is if you inspect outbuildings, charge more and inspect it. And if you didn't, if you don't want to do it and you didn't charge for it, don't inspect it and make sure that you tell people outbuildings were not inspected. So it's kind of like being pregnant. You either are or you aren't. So you either do inspect outbuildings or you don't. There's no in between. So here we can see that this inspector chose a kind of a wishy-washy type of a attempted disclaimer where he or she is saying outbuildings are normally not a part of a home inspection. Well, they're not. <clears throat> Any inspection of an outbuilding, should there be one parenthetical, is strictly for the convenience of the client. Hmm. A thorough inspection is not included nor accomplished with this inspection. Any comments concerning this in, in outbuilding are strictly for your information and should not be considered part of the inspection. God, yeah, and this went on and on. So th this is a guy, I, I, I understand that this inspector is trying to provide a little extra service by taking a quick look at the outbuilding. Okay, but this is a wishy-washy disclaimer. It's not gonna work. If there's something wrong with that outbuilding and if you know, the, the bad wolf, wolf comes along and blows it down and, and the inspector gets sued, that's not gonna protect you. So I would say you did not inspect the outbuildings or if you contracted to inspect them, because I know we ask when we book inspections, is there a pool? Because we'll charge extra to do a pool. Are there um, cabanas or guest houses? or uh, outbuildings, stables, corrals, things like that, that they might want inspected, and we charge extra for them. Now, if they choose not to pay and don't want them inspected, we still note in the report that they existed, but were not inspected at your direction. So we make sure it's clear in the report what we did. You know, sometimes you'll arrive and there's an attached garage and a detached garage. <clears throat> so you'll want to you're required to do the primary one that's attached to the building for our standards, but the detached one should be an extra fee, which is why we ask about these when we're booking inspections. Are there any other buildings on the lot is basically what we ask. So anyway, this is not going to get you, you know, out of trouble <laughs> if there's an outbuilding and you made some comment about something, uh, you know, be much more clear with your disclaimers. Now, this one was interesting. This is a, a, a report <clears throat> that I got during a, it was a legal case where I was testifying on behalf of the home inspector. And this was the, my opposing experts report. Now, th there was a lot of items that were included in the inspection and in the claim. And um, we, uh, we, uh, we you know, went up against each other and I'm looking at, and Wellman, I'll get to your comment in just a second. I, I uh, want to talk about that. So this one here, you can see the inspector found rafter in the garage have been confirmed to have mold fungus called stereotystis, which a deadly disease that caused oak tree to go into defense and dry up and die. Okay, so <laughs> and inspector does not find any strong evidence that mold is dangerous to human, but needs to be removed anyway. Kind of like a, well, just do it because I said so. And then please note, the lab results will follow as confirmation. So, you know, we're there and I had the attorney ask this guy, I said, so you can actually determine the, the type of mold by looking at it, which, you know, I, I don't know anybody, unless you've got electron microscope in your eye, uh, it's got to be pretty difficult to do that. So this was just something that's not, you're not able to substantiate. So clearly you don't want to make statements in a report that you cannot verify. So something, if you can't verify it personally, I would not make the statement. Now, certainly you can recommend that it be, be uh, tested and so on, but how can you identify it without, without you know, having a lab test? So this was an a, a, uh, action where the inspector was, was found to be 
uh, zero negligent and uh, the uh, home buyer got nothing in this arbitration. But it's probably a lot of it was because this inspector didn't do his homework. So I want to get back to the question. There was a comment in the uh, in the uh, uh, chat about detached garages um, are part of a regular inspection. I, I think it depends. But now the way that I look at it is that we're required to inspect the primary parking structure, I believe is what our standards say. So with a house that with an attached garage, that was what we would consider anyway, a primary parking structure. And if there's another garage detached, then that would be extra. Now, if the main house did not have a garage attached to it, well, then that one garage that's there, that's the primary parking structure. So that would be included. So maybe I just misspoke. So I'm sorry about that if I did. Anyway, going back to this comment, you know, make sure that you can verify what you're saying. It's very important. Now this one, <laughs> now I know this is a driven rod that's kind of in a driveway. Now. The home inspector's caption of this of this photograph, I think, was probably this sounds like it was a voice to text or something software, because we've got the electrical ground is lactated close to the garage, penetrating through the asphalt. Use caution when drinking in this area. So I think this is supposed to mean the electrical ground rod is located close to the, the garage and use caution when driving in this area, but just goes to show you how sometimes, you know, this voice to text or, or whatever was being used here to create this, this, um, this paragraph or this caption for this photo, you know, certainly is not accurate. So this is a, where you, you need to proofread and this kind of stuff, when you see this in the report, especially if it's multiple times, when, when it's a, a claim that we're looking at, this really affects credibility of the home inspector. So this stuff is important. Remember that your report is your work product. And if there's a, a claim regarding that inspection, think a couple, three years later, this is about all that's going to exist. Although I would hope that you kept all your photographs you took that day, including the ones that are not in the report, because they can be very helpful. This one here, you know, it, when you have multiple mistakes like this in a report, it really affects credibility and, and it can be harmful to, to getting rid of the claim. So, and now we have uh, the question, oh, Tom, yeah, you're right. Does not have eight inches, yeah. It should be all the way in the dirt, I think is what you're saying here. Yeah, it should be all the way driven, that's true too. But, you know, what I'm trying to point out is that we've got this, this caption to the photo. Think about report writing. Think about a judge or, or a plaintiff's attorney reading your report in two years about this property. And I can tell you right now, you know, this will affect credibility and your client will remember it because this is what they all say. Oh, the home inspector was there for about 45 minutes. Every time, that's what they say. You know, I don't know how that happens. This is why I like to put arrival time and depart time actually in the report. So it shows how long I was there because it's, I, it has not been 45 minutes on any inspection I, I think I've ever done. Okay, moving on. <clears throat> so documenting inaccessible areas is something which is important. And I think you know, a lot of us used to, or maybe even still will rely upon kind of a boilerplate single statement in the report that says the home was occupied various parts of the home including the garage or maybe attic and so on, were, uh, were full of storage or were you know, blocked by, to, to view by furniture and, and personal items and so on and were not inspected. I believe that when we have something like this, and especially attics that look like this, we should have another separate line item in the report about this because this is unusually heavy storage, which I understand because you know, you're trying to sell a house and the real estate agent is telling you to declutter, to get rid of the stuff that's that's cluttering up the home. So where does it end up? In the garage. You know, that's typical. So this photo on the left, I would say that the garage, you know, is was overly, was full of storage. We were unable to inspect walls, slab, uh, vehicle door, vehicle door hardware, electrical, and you know anything else that might exist there, we don't know what equipment could be there, maybe a water shutoff or something. And I would say that hidden damage may exist because it's true. 
And we also offer in the report that we were happy to come back and reinspect this area once the obstructions are removed. And we tell them what the fee is, it's 450 bucks. So we tell them the fee so that people know we don't come and do it for free. So that we charge to come back because you know people will say, oh, it's only gonna take you 20 minutes. Well, that's not true. It's gonna take longer than that. Plus I have to drive there and back. It's taken up a time slot. I could be doing something else. And I'm sure they're gonna want something to write. So you can see this, this photograph on the right. <clears throat> this is one I took in a garage where I was back by the, uh, the person door going into the house and took a photograph of that entire garage. And you can see I've been up in the trusses is full of storage. So I had to include, I can't inspect the underside of the roof and the roof trusses, or at least it was very limited because of that storage. So you know, this is the kind of stuff I think that we need to document uh, separately. I do the same thing for crawl spaces. Many times, um, let's say, let's divide up a typical square house. I know a boring square house in the four quadrants in the crawl space. And maybe the access door is at the southwest corner. And that's where I go in and I crawl in and there's pipes and duct work and all kinds of things in the way. So maybe I can enter, say 15 feet. And then my, any further entrance is blocked by pipes or, or duct work or personal storage, whatever it might be. So I'm gonna take pictures of that and put it in the report and disclaim inspection of the rest of the crawl space and tell people that we were unable to get there. Here's why, here's the photograph of the obstructions and there may be hidden defects present. So, you know, it's, it's true. I don't know what's in there because I can't see it and they need to understand that there could be hidden defects. So I've been using that that phrase in my reports for probably a decade now. And uh, it's become a good tool because it puts people on notice that, hey, there could be something wrong in here. Just because I can't get there doesn't mean everything's okay. It means that it should be looked at. And we offer to come back, certainly for a fee, but uh, we'll come back and look. Okay, <clears throat> so this one, just unusual stuff. You know, now this is kind of, you know, what is this? It's a trailer without an axle. So there's no axle, no wheels on it. So it's kind of just sitting there. So what do we call this thing? So I said it was not inspected. This is a, you know, a separate uh, uh, RV or thing or trailer. And we did not enter it because it's, you know, it was locked. And I, I don't know what that sign is. That's somebody's attempt, I guess, to, to keep people out of there. But uh, we made sure that we noted it was on the property and it was not part of our inspection. So I'm not going in that thing to take a look at it. Plus, I don't even know if it's going to come back. Okay, <clears throat> so here's some more text from a report. And you can see that um, this home is serviced by polybutylene waste plumbing lines. So I don't. I've never seen polybutylen uh, DWV. I know it certainly it was water supply from the street, big blue, and it was polybutylen was water supply dis or distribution tubing inside the house. We all have seen that, although I have not seen any used for DWV. So the tip here is if you don't know how to identify a material, just call it plastic. You know, that would have sufficed here. We would have met the standard of practice to call it what it is. The material is plastic. And it's true, there is a piece of cast iron that's going out the foundation wall and probably continues to the septic tank or to the street, wherever it goes. So if you don't know the proper name for something or what the material is, you know, take a picture and ask somebody who knows, or just call it by its most basic generic name, which in this case would be plastic. You know, that would work. Now here's a, an inspector being a pest control expert, which in most states, certainly in the states where, or in California where I inspect now, <clears throat> it's a separate license for structural pest control, which is basically termites and wood destroying uh, organisms. So I don't have that license. So I don't comment about the specific wood destroying organism like termite, powder post beetle, subterraneans, whatever it might be, carpenter beetle or carpenter ants or, or uh, bees and so on. I don't comment on the specific infestation. However, if I see something, I will tell my clients, you know, this we saw deteriorated wood at such and such a location. 
we recommend that you have it inspected by a licensed pest control expert and treated and repaired as recommended. So in this case here, you can see where the inspector uh, identified the infestation as termites, which is actually you know, commenting outside of your licensure, and then recommended to consult a licensed pest control tech to determine the severity and, and related damages. So admits that he's not licensed right in the paragraph. So you know, don't say termite, don't identify the specific infestation. Uh, you can say that there was deteriorated wood, or I, I know I got a, a, a opinion from the, the pest control board, at least here in California, that we can say wood destroying organism because it's not specific. Because you know, lots of things are wood destroying organisms that could even be fungus. So uh, just once again, generic, don't identify the specific uh, infestation, insect or or fungus. All right, <clears throat> some common problems that we see in reports, and this list keeps getting longer, so I have to keep adding to it. So internal inconsistency is something that we see quite a bit. Um, and Hollis, the inspector is responsible to value, oh, damage, yeah, if you see damaged wood, we should comment on it. We just shouldn't comment about the specific infestation uh, insect or animal or whatever it is. At least that's my understanding in, in my state. Um, I, I think uh, Virginia may be the same. I, I don't know, frankly, I don't remember. It's been a while since I inspected there. Anyway, uh, do what Hollis says. Damage cost, okay, cool. All right, so whatever Hollis says, that's what you should do in Virginia. Um, internal inconsistency with marketing materials. So we see this quite a bit where a website will say, we inspect everything from the bottom of the footing to the you know, peak of the roof. So that could, could cause some unreasonable expectations because people will read that literally that you've inspected you know, under the, the actual footing, which we can't see. So you know, make sure that your marketing materials are, um, are consistent with what you do. So don't be inconsistent. Uh, don't say that you inspect like all the buildings on the site if you don't. So anyway, um, internal inconsistency, not a good thing. Lack of a contract is a big deal. So you know, we're still seeing some inspections done where the inspector can't find the contract. You know, once you get a signed contract, make sure that you're keeping that. Matter of fact, we, I don't think there's any excuse anymore for not having one. We use a, a service called EverSign, which as soon as we are within an hour of booking the inspection, we, we send the client the contract for signature via this service. Uh, it's kind of like DocuSign. There's several different ones out there. And you know, everybody signs it. We get it signed. We tell them how we want payment. And most of the time we have signed, or, or most of the time we have payment. We always have signed contract because we won't go. The day before, if we don't have a signed contract, we let them know that we must have that back or we can't go to the inspection due to insurance regulations. And basically, you, you all know that you don't have coverage by your insurance unless you have a signed contract. So I don't even want to go there without coverage. So we want to make sure we get it first. Also, many inspectors are using a, an outdated or non-compliant contract. So make sure you keep up to date with the rules regarding home inspection in, in your states. And you know, as I do here, because every once in a while things change. So I've seen contracts where there's clauses in the contract that are in direct violation of very specific state law regarding home inspection. So make sure that your client is, or your, your contract is compliant with state laws. And you may wanna have a, a uh, uh, attorney looking over it who's familiar with the laws in your state. I know that uh, some home inspector associations publish, uh, um, uh, state associations, I should say, publish um, uh, standards of practice along with, with uh, contracts for their members. So that's something to, uh, to consider. So, and, and if you have a standard contract that most inspectors use, it could be called a standard of the industry, which is what We've done that in California. Most of us use the same contract. Um, inspectors don't communicate properly or piss people off. You know, this happens. <clears throat> so, you know, unfortunately we're in a, a business where you, you have to be up pretty much every day. And we need to be good at presenting negative information in a positive manner. 
That's pretty much what a successful home inspector has mastered is that presenting this, this, you know, it's always negative. That's what we're hired for, the negative information about the house, but to provide it to people in a positive fashion. So, you know, basically anything can be fixed with them. Uh, it just takes money. So, and we all know that. So communicating effectively is important. Make sure that people understand. And sometimes you have to spend that extra you know, 20 minutes explaining things to your clients. You know, that's what it takes. They're laypersons. It's not, you know, you and me talking where I would understand right away what you mean, but we're talking to lay people who don't understand houses as much as we do, which is a good thing. That's why we have jobs. So make sure that you're, you're communicating uh, effectively and you take the time. I know sometimes it can be annoying, but you know, that's, that's part of the job. Now, this is an important one is clients don't understand the report because of too much technical jargon or, or just improper wording. Many times they don't even read the report. So that's a pretty common thing is people will admit you know, after a claim that they didn't read the report, which is great when they do for the inspector, but um, that this happens. <clears throat> and many times people will just read the summary, even though we tell them in the report, please read the entire report. This is just a summary of the key points and blah, blah, blah. You know, this is what happens. So people are in a hurry. You know, they're, they're making the biggest commitment of their life in most cases. But you know, the amount of paperwork now, I don't know if you bought a house recently, but it's a pile of paper about like that, about two inches. And we're supposed to read everything. So I, I know what I did was after the home inspector was done with our house inspection, I just called him. I said, so what's important? <laughs> so you know, I didn't want to read it either. And then um, we need to recommend action prior to the end of the inspection contingency period. Now, I know a lot of us do this in a, in a boilerplate statement at the beginning of the report. That, you know, maybe any action items noted below should be investigated uh, further by licensed contractors and and you know you can uh, so you understand all the repair options and cost or whatever your 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 disclaimer your notice is. But um, on significant issues like the house needs a new roof, I find if the roof is completely deteriorated and needs to be replaced, contact a roofing contractor prior to the end of the inspection contingency period so you're aware of repair or replacement options and costs. So I want to make sure that people understand for the significant items. Uh, the big thing. Now, Mark, I know you disagree with contingency period, and that's okay, but we use it here because that's the only time where people can get an expert to the house and get their, their evaluation done and get a cost done. Matter of fact, if we don't tell people this, here's an issue I've run into, is that what happens is the inspector made a comment in the report to get a roofer out to evaluate the roof or to review the roof and provide estimates <clears throat> because he found something wrong. Well, the client waited three months. They had moved in in 30 days and a couple months later got around to it and then made a claim against the home inspector. Well, you didn't tell me to do this, you know, before I bought it. And now it's going to be 30 grand for a new roof. So that's the kind of stuff that can happen. So I'm just trying to help prevent that. So you guys make your own business uh, decision. Next one, <clears throat> or next, next list. Excessive boilerplate can be an issue. Um, Settlement or closing. Yeah, you know, Mark, I know settlement or closing. We used to use that. The problem is that the only time that your client has to actually get, get people per the contract to that house to look at it is the inspection contingency period. Now, that's here in California and some other states I've worked in. Might be different in Virginia. I haven't sold a house in Virginia in a long time. So it could be different. What's that? Can I say something quickly? Yeah, of course. Yeah. What I'm saying is, if you use the word that it needs to be done, you're recommending prior to settlement or closing, okay? The okay. contingency experience, period could expire the day after doing the inspection. Oh, sure. There's Absolutely. We recommend, there, yeah, we recommend uh, people get an extension. <laughs> it's, it's the wording of their addendum. They propose an addendum on the basis of the home inspection to get this done prior to settlement. OK, because yeah. so much of the time we get a call and, oh, my contingency expires the day after tomorrow. Oh, sure. Yeah, me too. Me too. So, you know, that's whatever works best for you certainly yeah. you know, is, is cool. So thanks, Mark. All right, let's move on. Yeah, I am. So excessive use of boilerplate is a problem. So we see I see the word appears a lot. 
you know, appears this, appears that. To only use the word appears because it's a visible or visual inspection. Everybody knows you're looking at. So we don't need to use the word appears, you know, all the time. I've counted one report that had the word, that word appears in the report 75 times. So, you know, use it for something that if you're unsure, okay, then it makes sense. But, you know, roof appears to be composition shingles. I mean, come on, <laughs> you know what it is. So, and then the further evaluation thing, I would use that, um, you know, sparingly as well, because sometimes we see further evaluation, like a, a toilet, the toilet was running or the supply valve was leaking or something. Do you think further evaluation by a plumber? I, I just say these repair. So I don't think it needs too much more evaluation. So just be careful with that. And then too many words in the report can be a problem as well. I remember reading a report recently where it was, gosh, it was like a page and a half explaining a composition shingle roof. And they first went into how the composition shingle roof is made. And there was a, a, a graphic of the of a, it was, I think it was a lamin laminated shingle showing the two pieces laminated together and how it's made. And so nobody cares. <clears throat> All your client cares about is what's wrong. The second thing they care about is who's gonna pay for it. And that's not our problem. So, you know, make sure that, keep it brief. Matter of fact, the, the, key, uh, the key issue should be first. Your headline should be roof needs to be replaced. You know, it should be, first in line, not buried somewhere in the text because they're gonna stop reading it. So be careful with too many words. You know, make sure that you're writing English or whatever the chosen language is for your home inspection so that people understand what you're writing. And I gave you some good examples of, of semi-English uh, in those photo captions. So be careful what you're, what you're writing. Stick to your scope of licensure. Don't be trying to tell people you know, structural issues or that kind of, unless you're licensed, you know, if you've got an architectural degree or a license or something like that, well, then you can be, you know, give some higher level information to your clients should you choose. So, you know, I would say, don't say something like in the report, here's one that got an inspector in trouble one time was, he said in the report, like the first three sentences, this home is structurally sound, which, you know, that kind of infers engineering a little bit, so be careful what you're saying. And then failure to relay the magnitude of the defect is a big thing because I've had, I can't tell you how many times I've had a claim come to my desk and the first thing I do is call the inspector and the inspector tells me, you know, I wish I had worded that more strongly. <laughs> so just think about that when you're writing your report <clears throat> that you don't want to have to tell tell your insurance adjuster or me or somebody, you know, that sentence, because, you know, make sure you're relaying the magnitude of the defect. If the roof needs to be replaced and they can expect further deterioration, you know, because of continued leakage and it needs to be fixed now, make sure that you're relaying that magnitude. Or even if it's a safety item, if you have a, a broken receptacle that a kid could, start, or an adult acting like a kid, could stick their finger in and get electrocuted. That's important. It's an extreme safety issue. So that should be relayed as well, even though it may only cost five bucks to get the part. So it's not really related to cost, although partially, you know, if it's a safety item, regardless of what it would cost to fix it, I would get that fixed uh, or recommend it be done immediately too. So make sure you explain why the client should care in your reports. Okay, <clears throat> now walk and talk inspections. This is something, a phenomenon that we're seeing in this market now because people are making offers, you know, way over asking. There's, you know, eight people, 20 people in line with cash offers and they're, and people are waiving the inspection contingency and they're trying to get in and kind of sneak in an inspector on a, on a, 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 a showing. So I know some inspectors doing this. I think the state of Ohio just recently ruled that this is uh, improper, but just be careful if you're doing them. So it, it's something, make sure it's covered under your E&O. <clears throat> and uh, remember that there's no record of findings. So when you're done, you know, whatever he said, she said, is gonna be one of those if there's a, there's a complaint. And I haven't seen a standard of practice for a walk and talk. So just remember that you can still get sued. So be careful. I see I'm generating here. We call them walk and talk consultations. Yeah, so Virginia, Maryland have recently issued a statement, Hall says, I don't know what that is, but you know, just study it, just know what's going on, know what your state, how they interpret it, 
and they, you know, you can call it a consultation. I know inspectors that do that, but still, okay, everything I have in this slide still applies. I don't care what you call it. So, you know, you can still get sued. So just remember that and be prepared for it. So I would ask your E and O provider, you know, do they have a policy on this? Because so many inspectors are doing it. You know, it's all over, and I get it. I understand why. It's because of the market. Okay. <clears throat> So let's get back into some, some report writing funny stuff here. So this <clears throat> was an inspection report where the home inspector used his report from the prior day and just changed the wording to, to hopefully to fit the house he's inspecting today. However, he didn't change all the boilerplate language. And this ended up being a big deal because this was a, there was a lot of structural issues up in the attic and his insurance company ended up settling this one for, I think around 50,000. It was a big deal. I was at this house twice <clears throat> and it was, it was a big deal. So if you look down here, let's, let's ignore the green for now. And you can see the attic not inspected. Okay. And then we have comments about attic access blocked. Inspect when seller's items removed. Now there's no offer here to come back and so on. You know, who inspects? <clears throat> and in this photograph, he did have a red arrow towards the attic hatch, and you can see below it in the whole photo, there was just a bunch of crap piled up underneath it. So I don't blame him. I wouldn't have moved it either. And we have main attic down here at the bottom, method of inspection, no access, not inspected. Okay, got it. Number three, not inspected again. And then percent of attic, unable to inspect, 75%. Hmm. So that means you can see 25% even though it says you didn't go in there. And then back up to the green, it should be noted that the roof support framing system viewed from within the attic revealed no visual evidence of stress or effect. He didn't change the boilerplate. So this whole sentence here, of course, the plaintiff's attorney said, well, my client understood that you went in the attic and there were no problems. You know, even though we can see that there's no inspection, but it's, it's conflicting. We have internal inconsistency here. You know, extreme example. So this was, uh, this was a problem. This was real difficult. How do you defend this? You know, the way the report's written, you know, as, the, as the inspector's expert, what am I supposed to say? Well, you meant something else? <laughs> it's kind of hard to, uh, hard to defend this one. Now, <clears throat> this report, I believe in brevity. I think it's a good thing. You want to, you know, bullets are great and just, you know, here's what's wrong. But this one, this is a little extreme. This is the interior page of this inspection report. And this is it. This was it. So we have ceiling materials, drywall, floor surfaces. Basically, they're just, you know, what the floor coverings are. Type of windows, double single hung. Doors are wood, hollow core, and sliding glass. That's it. Done. So I don't think this meets the standard of care. I think there should be some more information here. <laughs> it's just, that's it. Now, the next one is even better. Here's your fireplace page. So I'm presuming that there isn't one. I would say at least right in there, none present or, or something. So, you know, just a blank page. You know, you know what, bare minimum, there should be something there like this page intentionally left blank, like we see in, in you know, mostly government documents. So <clears throat> this is just, just weird, just an empty page. So I would suggest not doing this, at least tell people that there wasn't one, which I believe is what this means. Okay, now this one, this is a crawl space inspection, and you can see that the access was, he says, was blocked. Now, 10, 12 inches of standing water, blah, 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 and he's saying that the there's insulation in place, although I think most of it's in the water. Um, so, you know, this is another wishy-washy one, right? I get it, the inspector wasn't able to get in there, but he wants to provide as much in information to the client as possible. However, you, know, you can't inspect fully when there's this much water. So I would just say, was not inspected. Hidden defects most likely exist, get it cleaned up and we'll come back and here's our fee. And, you know, not try to do a wishy-washy thing like this because you'll get in trouble. You know, I, I mean, I get it. I know you're trying to provide a service, but, you know, with just looking at it from the access opening, it's difficult to really tell what's, what's going on there. Okay. <clears throat> now, sometimes again, too much information. This is a, uh, talking about floor structure, looking at a basement or maybe a crawl space. So, you know, supported by two inch by 10 inch wood joists, space 16 inches on center, eight by 12 inch built up with all this. You know, 
if, if there's something else in there and somebody finds it, <laughs> you're in trouble. So I don't know as I put in the, the measurements of the framing, I would probably just say conventional wood framing. So um, anyway, now that's, that's what I would do. I'm looking at a chat, we've got a whole big long. Well, that's too much for me to read, Mark, sorry. Anyway. It's okay, we'll just do it out there for others. Good, yeah, I'll look at it later. Okay, so we've got other common problems. I see this all the time in reports. This is a pet peeve of mine, saying that stains are old. Well, of course they were, because they got there before you got there. But you don't know if the cause of the stain, the source, has been successfully repaired. You can see that this inspector says, water stains appear to be old. Well, doy, you know, it's, they're historical stains. But you don't know if this means that they're, if it's been successfully repaired. So we need to comment, was it repaired? So, you know, don't just say old stains. I see that a lot and they turn out to be sure they're old stains and you know what, it's still leaking. So be careful on that. I've, I've seen this probably a dozen times in a report where we had to respond to a claim. Now this one, this is me and the inspector going back to look at this house because there was a claim about three months after the, the, uh, the, the thing settled. And you can see here, we're walking through the house and there's these fabricated gutters out of aluminum foil draining into these, these casserole pans. And he says to me, well, it was like that when I did the inspection. I said, well, I didn't see that in your report. He said, well, I didn't think I had to because it was so you know, obvious. I'm like, you gotta put, I don't care how patent or obvious it is, you put it in the report. So, you know, this was, was 20 grand for a, a new door because they had to flash it into this balcony surface and everything. So it was a pain in the neck repair. Now this is one where, I can't remember who sent me this. I think it was Scott Patterson from Ashy, but he had a client call <clears throat> and um, complained that there was water coming out of the electric meter. He was like, no, it can't be. So, well, they sent him a picture. And so sometimes, you know, you, you think what your client tells you is, sounds uh, unrealistic. Well, it might be true. And this was actually a, an error on the behalf of the, uh, the uh, utility company where they didn't seal the direct burial cable where it inserted into the riser, the two inch PVC. And this was one of those lots where the utility trench was downhill towards the house, you know, which is way down there when you're up on the street. So just the uh, water flows during a heavy rain and the disturbed soil and it ended up coming out of the meter. So kind of interesting. Now here's right, another right. room. Yeah. Right. yeah. Jim here, Jim Vaughn here. Hey, what's I up? Sent you, I sent you that picture. Oh, okay, you sent it. All right, but well, that's what happened, right? Yeah, they they couldn't get the uh, service cable into the conduit, so they cut the top of the conduit off even with the, with the grade. Cool. Well, you know what? As soon as we hang up, I'm going to put your name on that picture for the next show. I thought it was Scotty that sent me that. Thank you, Jim. All right. So this is a report where this inspector, I think, needs to make sure he defines his uh, grading system. It's good, fair, poor, I think it was. Well, you know, make sure you define that because the word good could mean something completely different to you than what it means to me. And you can see, here's the view of the roof, same photograph or same report, and this is the roof. So we can see this ponding. And then I get to the next page and there's patched shingles. There's significantly, there's worn, look at this, these shingles are beat up. And I'm like, really? You know, are you sure? Would you guys grade this roof and gals? Would you grade that good? I don't think so. So this ended up being a claim where the roof leaked and, and I think the insurance company declined to you know, cover the roof when they finally got somebody out there. So it was, I think this cost the inspector's insurance company, you know, 20 grand or so. This was in Florida. Uh, here's another one. Now, I don't know of any standard of practice that requires you to identify whether sewage disposal is public or private. I think that's, a, a matter of fact, that's a specific exclusion in, in nearly all the standards of practice that I've read and also codified standards of practice. So, you know, I would suggest that you don't do this. I've worked on at least two dozen claims where the inspector said it was on public sewer and it wasn't. So this is a big deal. You know, I would say, take it out of your report is my best suggestion because you don't have to put it in there. But if you think that you must put something in there, at least put in how, how it was determined and recommend that this be verified. You know, do what the realtors do on the MLS. They say information included herein is deemed as reliable, however, should be verified. So do something like that, you know, I think would help. But, uh, 
tell them just to go to the you know, public health department or ask the seller or something. So you don't have to do this. You don't have to get that exposure. Now, here's a guy talking too much about codes. We got, you know, all this go 1978 required, but well, heck, we don't know when the house was plan checked. That could have been a couple of code cycles before it was built. So I would suggest staying away from codes. And then just to remember, be careful what you put on your website. This was an inspector who provided some made up uh, assurance guarantee, not, not a warranty he bought from a warranty company. And he says in his website, we pay for repairs. And there's no asterisk here with the fine print or it just, it just says we pay for repairs. I'm like, really? <laughs> so this was difficult to uh, defend this, this claim as well. Um, this is one where the inspector says we do a visual inspection, blah, blah, blah. But then he says we, we perform representative probing to check for presence of concrete footer. Don't do that. You know, I mean, gosh, I, I don't know what's down there. I do you know where to probe. So, you know, this is just a way to get in trouble. This is a report that was a handwritten one where, you know, I, I don't know. I thought he was trying to be a comedian. He's got the attic area as visible, didn't observe any water stains. And then hay is in hay for horses. Um, this is good. And then something about ham and egg or patching. And, you know, I mean, come on. Here's another report by an inspector who I can't read his writing. This is a punch list that some contractor gave to, uh, to somebody as, uh, in Massachusetts as, a, um, as an actual inspection report. So this does not comply with Massachusetts law. In every state you're gonna have, these guys are gonna be out there that are offering a home inspection when it's really just a punch list or, or they're looking for work. So that's what, that's what this was. But this was passed off as a home inspection. This is what somebody sent me uh, that they, they got for 150 bucks as a home inspection. And then just a couple of things, because uh, I know we're, I want to allow some time for questions. Um, choose your words carefully in your reports. I would suggest that we do not use the code word. I've seen where inspectors say it's not for code. Well, you know, none of us, unless you're a deputized building official, have the authority to comment about codes and require people to, to you know, write up a correction order. That's not, we don't have that authority. So, I use the word not serviceable, not standard, substandard, unconventional, inadequate, needs service, temporary repair, um, instead of saying code. Once in a while, I'll use minimum standard. That's a good uh, uh, substitute. And then assigning responsibility. This can get you in trouble too. I've heard home inspectors say, oh, that looks like a homeowner repair. Well, your client, might think that, oh, the seller did that and complain that, you know, you, the seller did it when it might just have been an amateur, uh, you know, a licensed contractor. We don't know who did it. I wasn't there. So don't assign responsibility. Don't say it's, you know, it's jury rigged or it's a homeowner, hairy homeowner repair. I just call it a temporary repair. That's it. And don't get it fixed. Also, I don't say that's illegal. Once again, I don't have uh, deputization uh, authority <clears throat> from our local municipality to do this type of inspection or make this kind of a claim. What I've had people ask me on site, is that legal? And I'll tell them, don't know. That's not part of my purview. I'd suggest that you call the city, you know, the municipal building and safety department and ask them if it's legal or not. And then this one is funny too. I hear people say, especially real estate agents, is this grandfather? I don't know. I've never heard of any such category in a zoning or in a code, um, um, you know, um, type of a of a category in any type of municipal um, um, ordinance or whatever. So, grandfathering to me, I've heard that used for licensing, where basically it means that old guys who've been doing it for a long time get to come in, maybe without taking an exam or without the experience requirements or whatever. But I've never heard that used in a zoning ordinance. So. You know, people say grandfather, and I'm like, I don't know. It's kind of like when people say, when you're doing an inspection and somebody says to you, would you say something is not, you know, is incorrect? They say, well, that's the way they do it out here in the country. Like, well, so, because you're in the country, it's okay to be unsafe? You know, it, it shouldn't make any difference. All right. <clears throat> Here's what I learned personally. Um, I noted that a pool heater was turned off and, uh, and it was uh, not tested, recommended activate. 
Well, I got a call about two months later from a woman who said, well, we had to turn on and it needed $800 worth of repair. I said, yeah, okay. You know, I said the gas was off. It was not tested and recommend activate. She said, well, you didn't tell me it needed to be repaired. I said, no, I told you it was not tested because it was the gas was off and recommended it be activated. She said, but you didn't tell me it needed to be and we kept going. I was like, no, I'm not paying. But it changed my my method of reporting. Now I'll say, you know, let's say it's a furnace, it's turned off the time the inspection recommended be activated, performance inspected prior to the close of the transaction, and that repairs may be necessary. So there you go. So now I'm making sure that I tell them it might need to be fixed. And then you know, make sure that you're explaining the reason people should care about things, especially if it's electrical. Um, you know, maybe you have an oversized breaker for the size wire, a fire could happen. You know, you could be, you could go to the extreme like that if you want, um, you know, double uh, splicing or double terminations into a lug, that kind of thing. So, you know, whatever it might be, make sure that you're explaining it to people and that there could be other things too in that system. When I find a couple of things wrong with the electrical system, Let's say I got you know six things. I'm going to tell my clients in the report that you know, we found six things, and certainly there may be when the, an expert comes out, an electrician, and inspects the system, other conditions may be found. That's true. It happens all the time. You know, we're there as the as recon, we tell them, hey, you need to get this looked at, and there might be, here's what we saw, you know, including but not limited to, there may be more stuff wrong. So make sure that you're you're telling people that, and make sure if you can. Get your client there so you can talk to them and go through it and you can show them stuff that's wrong so that they fully understand it. You, know, you may have to take them under the deck and show them, hey, look up here, <laughs> you know, that there's just nails, there's no bolts or something like that. And a couple of things I've learned, <clears throat> never, ever, 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 ever leave the room while operating a plumbing fixture, ever. <laughs> I've worked on probably three dozen claims, <clears throat> excuse me, where the inspector has flooded the house. Never leave your ladder upright and unattended because you might come back 45 minutes later and there's two, like a three-year-old and a five-year-old climbed at the top of your ladder that you set left in the front yard, set up in the A position <laughs> and it'll scare the heck out of you. So it's always laying down or it's in the inspection wagon unless I'm using it. Don't leave the kitchen while testing appliances. I make sure everything's turned off before I leave. Um, don't comment on out of scope stuff. And don't say leaks are old because how do you know? <laughs> we talked about this. And don't make statements that you can't verify. Very important. And don't miss the important stuff <clears throat> or the real visible stuff like this one. You know, this was a claim. Inspector said he went in the crawl space. I'm like, you know, I don't think that just happened. So, you know, knob and two, make sure you tell people about it. Missing kickout flashing. As a matter of fact, in this case, it looks to me like missing flashing is pretty much everything. So, and then we have WellMed with their attic inspection mantra. If you're not moving, you're not inspecting. If you're inspecting, you're not moving. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so questions. Go ahead and let's do open mic. Any questions? Because I believe it or not, I have two gigs tonight. In a half an hour, I have to speak to another chapter. Too. <laughs> Mike, I'll just um, follow up on your your comment about walk and talk inspections. And I made that comment that um, that Maryland and Virginia have actually uh, both states have issued a statement. In essence, they're both pretty much the same. And what they're saying is <laughs> that if you're a licensed, in, in order to perform an inspection, you have to be licensed. Okay. And you have to perform inspections according to the to the standard. A walk and talk is not an inspection to the standard. Therefore, the state has no authority over walk and talks. Right. As long as you don't call it an inspection. Right. The minute you say it's an abbreviated inspection or it's a pre-inspection or anything that has the word inspection in it, you're in violation according to the interpretation by those two regulatory bodies. Yeah, and I think Ohio just jumped on, but they're a little more. Actually, they're saying it, it. You know, it shouldn't be done. So, you know, I, it doesn't matter to me if inspectors do it. But you're right; it should not be called a home inspection. It's a consultation. My concern is, you know, I'm thinking that in a year or two from now, I'm going to be seeing a lot of lawsuits, or not a lot, but there'll be some claims. There will be some claims, and it, it's going to be very difficult to defend because, you know, we don't know what happened on site or what was said. So, you know, just something to keep in mind. 
The, the other thing that you talked about that was location specific was about uh, termite inspection or pest control inspections. And you're absolutely right that both Virginia and Maryland require a specific license. So it, it is actually illegal for a home inspector to name the type of insect. Yeah, um, yeah same here. Yeah, and in, in, your, in your slide, the way, you, the way the guy had written that, he, he said it was termites, which he's not allowed to say. And then he right. said, talk to the termite guy about the damage, which is in his scope. Well, I know, and that's what I said. The guy's admitting in the paragraph that he's not licensed. So, <laughs> right. you know, it's kind of silly, but uh, you know, that, that's the way it is. And you know, we, we try to, to warn people. And the problem is, I'll, I'll tell you what, a lot of the claims that I get that I see are inspectors that I don't see at things like this, <laughs> unfortunately. You know, there are people that, that all of a sudden, you know, they get a claim and there's no, they don't have any record of CE and I, I don't see them around. You know, it's, you got to pay attention to what's going on. That's the, that's the thing. You got to get educated to keep going to, to this kind of stuff. 